Hi there and welcome to the first part of this tutorial series. We will be creating Pong in Unity and to start things off uh, let's have a look at our desired end result. So we can play this and we hear already some music playing, we can turn the volume down a bit and yeah we can just start the game and play with two players at once which is actually pretty tricky. <laughs> so we got the, the basic Pong logic going on, we got some effects, sound effects, a little starry background, a bit of screen shake and so on. So I'm gonna show you just quickly one more thing. Um, one second, uh, we also be creating an, a little AI opponent there, so that we can play the game even if we don't have a second player at hand or if we're bad at managing both our hands independently. So yeah, this series is mainly targeted at the beginner level, but there will also be some intermediate topics covered. Yeah, and we will have a little repository over on GitHub, you can find the link in the description, where you can check out the source code for the project. If you don't know about source control or Git yet, I highly recommend you to check this out, this is gonna help you a lot with game development. So before we jump into Unity, uh, let's check out what Pong actually is and what we need to do to get this game going. Uh, for this I prepared a little to-do list and you can see it right here. Uh, so today we're gonna implement the base game, the core of the game, which is gonna be the walls. They are not visible here, but we're gonna make them visible. Uh, then the moving ball, the score zones, which is where the ball ends up and gives the opposing player a point. Then we have to reset the ball to the center every time a player gets a point. We gotta have this little score UI up here. We're gonna take care of the game state, which is mainly gonna be the score for now. Um, and for this we're gonna write a little game manager, but it's gonna be extended a lot later. We're gonna implement these paddles and player input so that we can move them. And they also have to be reset. And what I call improvements here is something we are probably also going to do today, I'm not sure yet. So that we can uh, implement that the ball gets faster uh, the more it hits a paddle, so it gets more exciting as time goes by. Then we're gonna make the physics a bit better and yeah, we're gonna create this dotted line, which is I think not mandatory, but adds to the feeling. And then we have some more parts to the game that we're gonna add in the other parts of this tutorial series, uh, like the UI and flow that you saw, and uh, audio stuff, effects, the AI opponent, and uh, we're finally even gonna make a build of the game. So if you haven't set up Unity yet, I'm gonna quickly guide you through the process. Go to unity.com, go to developer tools and download Unity then download for Windows or for whatever your uh, operating system is and click this button and it's gonna download the Unity Hub. You have to install this, I already have this installed and once you open it, it's gonna look, well, not exactly like this because yours is gonna be quite empty. Um, so you're gonna go to installs, this is the versions of the Unity editor you got installed and click install editor and I recommend to go with the latest LTS version uh, of Unity 2020 which is up here. Uh, I already have this installed so let's check out what happens if we do this. Yeah, right here you can uh, choose the components that you wish to install. Uh, you should install Microsoft Visual Studio so that you have an IDE to work with. And yeah, since we're gonna build the game and if you're on Windows, then click this one here. If you're on Mac, gonna click this one. And yeah, for Linux, one of these two. And yeah, you don't need the offline documentation, I think you can just uncheck this. So once the installation has finished, go to projects and create a new project. We're gonna use the 2D template for this. You can choose a project name for this. Let's type in Unity Pong. And we're gonna choose a folder for this. Not in my music folder, but where do we go? I already prepared this. Like for me, I'm gonna use my Git repository uh, folder, uh, but you can choose wherever you want. And then hit create project. And now it's gonna take a little time. I'm gonna cut this. So it has finished creating the project for us and your editor layout might look different than mine. Um, maybe it 
could look like this. Uh, yeah, like this or like this. And yeah, if you want to know more about editor layouts, you can check out my tutorial on this. I'm going to use my own personal layout, which has this little console right here. Yeah, and now we are really going to start coding the game. But not really coding first, we're gonna do a little project setup first. So uh, we got the sample scene right here with the main camera in it. We're gonna create a few folders that we are going to need. So it's definitely always a good idea to keep your project neatly organized. Like we got a folder for art here, for audio, prefabs, we're gonna to get to that, and for our scripts. Let's rename our scene to something that actually resembles what it is, and let's just call it Pong. And we gotta reload the scene. So now let's create our level. And for this, uh, let's stay neatly organized. Let's create a level object so that it can have the level components as its children. We will create another level of hierarchy here for the parent of the walls because we're gonna have two walls. Um, and yeah, let's create the first wall. Let's call it wall. And what does our wall need? It needs to be displayed. For displaying 2D graphics, we got the sprite renderer component. And by the way, to add components, just click this button. Um, so now we don't have a sprite. What are we gonna do? We're gonna create one. Because we uh, chose the 2D template, we can just create a sprite right here. 2D sprites, and we only need a square for this. So now we can assign the square by dragging and dropping it. And there we go, we got a little square in our scene. Awesome. So this wall is gonna be at the top. Let's make it the top wall. Maybe at around five. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And it's gonna be way more wide. So let's go with 20. Yeah, that looks good. Good, and what else does our wall need? At first, let's, let's call this one North Wall. And yeah, it needs to have a physical body. And for this, we are going to use colliders so that the ball can bounce off it. Uh, you can see this little green line. I don't know if you can really see it, uh, but there's, there's a little green line around it. Maybe if we turn off the sprite renderer, now we can see it. This is colliders. Green lines in the scene view, always colliders. Like if you turn it off, the green goes away. So let's turn on the sprite renderer again. So yeah, now we got our north wall. What we need now is the south wall. We could just duplicate this one using control D and just move it down. But I like to, to, to get you thinking about these, these uh, workflows like, Every time you duplicate an object, these are not linked. Like if we want to change the color of the walls to say something like red, it's only going to change the one. But yeah, of course we can uh, just select both of them and change both their colors. Okay, that's possible, but in a, in a huge scene, this is going to get really, really difficult. So let's delete this and let's use what we call a prefab. Drag this one into the project view, and now it's become a prefab. And prefabs are great, because now we can drag this one in to create another one. We can call this one South Wall. And now we can change both of them with this asset. So wait, first of all, let's move this one down. These are now linked to the prefab. And if we change the color of this, it is gonna change both of them. And there is so much more than just color that you can do with this. So just keep in mind, prefabs are great. So yeah, now we got our walls set up, let's move on. So let's make our background black real quick. We are just gonna have to select the main camera and change its background color to black. Uh, looks already a lot more like Pong now. So one thing that is probably worth mentioning is what is actually a game object and a component. So a game object is an object inside the scene. So like pretty much everything you can click on in the hierarchy window here. And yeah, a game object can have as many components as you want it to have. Like we have the component sprite renderer and box collider 2D and these components determine its 
behavior and look and so on. And there's, for example, also the camera component that determines how how the camera looks into the scene. We can uh, change its size and zoom out and in. Yeah, stuff like that. So now that we got our walls ready, let's collapse this one by clicking the little arrow and we can tick it off our to-do list. Hooray! Next up, the ball. Let's create a new game object for the ball and let's just call it ball. And I'm not sure Unity sometimes just doesn't set things to zero, zero, but you can just click these little dots and reset and it's gonna reset the position. So what does our ball need? It also needs a sprite renderer and we're gonna give it a square. Again, this is a pretty big ball, so we're gonna decrease the scale maybe to 0.33. Yeah, this looks pretty good. This is a good size. And we're also gonna give it a box collider to D again, so it can have like physical interactions. And to actually have physical uh, physics to move the ball, we're gonna give it a rigid body to D so that we can move it. So now, if we save this and we're gonna put the ball under level because it belongs to the level. Uh, and if we pre press play, the ball is just gonna fall down. That's because it has gravity enabled on its rigid body. So let's set this to zero, try it again. And now it's gonna stay in place. But we don't want it to stay in place, we want it to move. And for this, we're gonna create our very first script. Right click, create and C sharp script. And let's call this one ball. And then just drag and drop it. And it's kind of, it's sometimes a little fiddly and just drop it here on the ball object. And now we can open the script in Visual Studio. So this is what a new script usually looks like in Unity. If you're already a little more advanced and want to know how to change this, I got a tutorial on this. And yeah, what we need now is to have a reference, like we can actually delete these. We don't need them for now. We're gonna add them when we need them these methods. What we need is a reference to our rigid body. And we're gonna call this one RB2D so that we can actually move the ball or better, the rigid body of the ball. And what are we gonna do now? We're gonna go into the start method. We're gonna create this one again, like we need it now. And we're just gonna say that rigid body to D its velocity is gonna be vector to dot left. So it should go to the left now when we start the game. Let's check this out. So once we start the game, we see nothing happening, but the console tells us that there's an unassigned reference exception. What does this mean? It means that our rigid body 2D here in the inspector, there is none assigned. Uh, to assign it, actually, we just drag in the ball object or we can also drag in that rigid body right here and now if we pre press play again it is gonna move to the left very slowly okay that's nice so just a quick distraction as i just noticed that i should have probably told you about this uh, this window up here is the scene view here we can select game objects and edit them for example move them around and this down here, we can click anything here. This is the actual game view, how it comes out on the other side. And we can use this maximize on play button. If we hit play and have this enabled, it's gonna give us an almost full screen preview of our game, which is great for testing. So back to our ball. We don't just want it to move straight to the left, but rather at a random angle. So for this, we are gonna introduce a new public variable called max initial angle and this is going to be on the range from 0 to 1 and we're gonna set this at 2 thirds for now maybe play with this later and what we're gonna do now is not just set this velocity to vector 2 dot left but we're gonna define our own vector and we're gonna call it dir for direction and let's oh let's let's use vector 2 left for this at first. So now it's the same as before and we're gonna feed this one into the velocity 
And what we are going to do now is like vector two dot left. Wait, let's let's take a little step back. Vector two dot left. We can hover over this, and it's gonna say what it's what it means. It is x minus one and y zero to the left. And what we want to do now is change the y direction, and we want to change this to a random one. So we're gonna use the random class and then random range, and we're going to go from negative max angle to positive max angle. And what we should see now when we start the game is that it moves at a random angle. Yeah, you can see it very slightly. Let's let's not maximize this anymore. Uh, so it's a random angle. It can be a very flat angle. So this is this is already more visible. Okay. So it takes a random angle every time. Let's give our ball a little movement speed multiplier next. So it doesn't move so slowly anymore. Uh, let's make another public float called move speed, and we're just gonna multiply the direction with this move speed to speed it up. So right now the value is set to one. This is like uh, we had it before and yeah, it's still gonna be super slow. We already know this, right? So, but we can change these values right here in the inspector. We can drag to the left and right and we can also type in a value. So let's try four and see how that feels. Yeah. That's almost good. All right, let's roll with this for now. So now we got this little problem uh, that once the ball hits a wall, it just sticks to it, but it should bounce off it. So for this, what we need to do is create a so-called physics material. So we're going to 2D, physics material 2D, and let's call this one bouncy. And we're gonna set, set the friction to zero and bounciness to one. And then we're just gonna move this rigid body up a little bit because we needed more than the box collider and actually more than the sprite renderer. So you can just rearrange these components however you like. So we're gonna give this rigid body a bouncy component and now it should bounce off the wall. Yes. So now our ball is pretty much functional and we're just gonna clean up the script a little bit and create a new method called initial push and move this code down here and call it from the start method so that it's all a bit cleaner. And we can actually tick the ball off our list. Yay! Next up, score zones. Let's create a new holder object for our score zones. And let's just call it score zones and an object for our score zone. So this one, it doesn't need a sprite renderer. We don't need it to be visible at all. Uh, so we're just gonna give it a box collider to D because it's it has to interact with the ball. And for this, it needs to have some collision shape. Um, we're gonna move it to the left maybe around here, yeah, minus 9.5, and we're gonna scale it up on the y-axis, maybe to 10, yeah, this covers the area, and it's just outside the camera view. And yeah, now we're gonna click is trigger here. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that a collider, which is it can be a trigger or not a trigger. And colliders that are not a trigger, they collide with each other. This is what we saw with the ball and the walls. And they can bounce off each other and impact each other. And when we have a trigger, they do detect the collision, um, but they don't bounce off each other. It just goes right through the ball. And yeah, we don't want the ball to bounce back into the field. We just want it to register that something has happened. Now we want the ball to do something when it enters the score zone. So let's jump back into our script and use the onTriggerEnterToD function. So this is called whenever our ball enters a trigger in the 2D space. So now we can just maybe check this real quick and use the debug log and just type 
la di da and jump back into unity and see if this works so the ball goes there and once it hit the zone it locked la di da just as we expected nice so now we need to distinguish what the ball hit because there could be multiple triggers in here like we need to say it hit a score zone and nothing else and for this we're going to create a new script for the score zone and assign it to the score zone and now we can go back into our ball script and just check score zone score zone if the other trigger that we hit has the component score zone on it and we're going to use get component for this so this means we're checking the other game object that we collided with if it has a component of score zone if it has a component of score zone this variable here score zone is not gonna be null so if score zone unequals null uh, or a shorthand notation for this is just to leave this unequals null out and just type if score zone i'm just gonna zoom in on visual studio a little bit so that you can see it better and yeah if we hit the score zone we're just gonna debug log do something and later on we're actually gonna do something so but for now let's just check if our code works so it hits the score zone and do something is called a little side note here we could also use tags to distinguish whether we hit the score zone we could give the score zone a tag and then compare this tag but I don't really like this approach I like the one with the with the components better because if we use the tag we can't actually do something with the score zone like we just compare the tag in this case this might be enough but in other cases we want to do something with the score zone maybe light it up or something like this so i really like this approach more with the component because it's much more versatile so now what we still have left to do is making the score zone on the other side and for this again because we duplicate an object we're going to turn it into a prefab and call this one score zone left and duplicate it call this one score zone right and move it to the other side just by removing this minus and it's right here all right now we can tick the score zones off our list which i already did and <laughs> We're gonna reset the ball next. So to reset the ball, we're gonna add two more public variables and one we're gonna call start x. This is the x position where the ball starts and we're gonna set it at zero. And the next one is uh, to make things a bit more interesting. We're gonna give it a random position, a random y position so that it always starts at a little bit of a different position. So, um, we got this in place and this is going to be four like the walls are at five we can also check this out if four is a good value like let's type in four here yeah this is not inside the wall so we're going to go with four here so let's create a new method for this and we're going to call this reset ball and yeah a little note again you see this private and public stuff uh, what does this actually mean like private means that only this component knows this method or variable um, yeah and public means that it can also be known and called and changed from outside this component so for example we got our start x here and now we can see oh yeah we just added it so it has to recompile that it's visible in the inspector because it's public we can actually make this private because I think we're not gonna change this in the inspector. Uh, so I'm just gonna move this down here. It's good practice to divide this up. Um, and now it's private and it's not visible in the inspector anymore and we can't change it anymore from the outside. We can still change it from here somewhere, but not from the inspector or other components. So back to our method, what do we actually want to do? We want 
to reset the ball to its initial position with a random Y. So let's create the random Y first, float random Y, or let's let's call this position Y uh, because it's, it's gonna be determined randomly, but it's gonna be a position at the end. And we're again gonna use our random range function and gonna go from max start y, negative max start y to max start y. And now we can create a position from this. And we're gonna make a new vector two. And we're gonna just give it our start position x. Yeah, start x. And this position y. All right, now all we gotta do is assign this position to the ball and uh, for this we take transform dot position equals position. So now we assign this position and now we gotta call this method from somewhere and where do we call it? Right, when it enters a score zone. So we're just gonna call it down here and see what happens. By the way, transform, this is this one uh, this is the component that determines the position, rotation, and scale of an object. And now we're dealing with the position. So let's start the game. And now, every time it enters the score zone, it comes out somewhere differently. There are two more things to do here. Like, uh, first off, it uh, still has the same angle as before. And for this, uh, we're just gonna call the initial push function. Oh yeah, it's good that we uh, moved this to its own method so we can just call it from down here, right? That's pretty nice. Uh, we can actually reset the ball at the beginning. Oh no, let's let's leave it at zero, zero uh, for the very start of the game. And yeah, now every time the ball comes out again, Oh yeah, okay. This, uh, what you saw right there, is a physics problem that we're gonna deal with later. Uh, don't worry, we're gonna fix this. So now it always comes out at a different angle, that's nice. The second thing we're gonna do is randomize whether the ball goes to the left or the right uh, in the initial push function. Right now it only goes to the left. Um, we can type in something like this. Um, let me explain this real quick. Random.value gives us a value between 0 and 1. So it's a shorthand notation for random.range from 0 to 1. And if it is below 0 0.5, we're going to change the initial direction to right. There is a different notation for this that I like a bit better, and that is called the ternary operator. Let me show you. Uh, it looks like this. So we got it all in one line. So how does, does this read out? This is the if statement. If random value is smaller than 0 0.5, then followed by a question mark, then comes the then. Then we take vector2.left. Otherwise, we take vector2.right. So let's see if this works. And immediately our ball goes to the right and then it goes to the left and to the left again and to the right. Great. One thing I want to do is increase the ball speed a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean just double it up. So now we got our ball moving at a decent speed and yeah, it resets quite properly. So let's take it off the list and get to the score UI. So for our UI, we're gonna be moving outside of the level. So let's close it for now and right click, create and UI canvas. This is where all our UI is gonna reside. And in the canvas scaler, change this value, the UI scale mode, to scale with screen size. This means that on different screen resolutions, we still have, the, the UI is still gonna look relatively the same. I'm gonna show you in a second what that means. Let's create a text. And for this, we're gonna use create UI and text text mesh pro. 
uh, TextMesh Pro is much better than the old Unity text component. It just renders in a much better resolution. It, the, the old text component of Unity just looks like a blurry mess in comparison. And uh, when you do this for the first time, you gotta import the TMP TextMesh Pro Essentials. Then you can close this. Let's call this one score text and yeah, let's position it. Like uh, let's position the text in the center and maybe we can enter a zero here so that we can see it better. Uh, no, we don't see it at all because it is super small. So let's move this one up. And so it is very small. So let's try something really big. Oh yeah. That already looks pretty good. 128. You will see I like powers of two a lot. Powers in two, of two and thirds. <laughs> you will see this a lot when watching my tutorials. So, and we're gonna position it to the left. And since our canvas has a width of uh, 1920, and we want it, maybe we, do we want it to be in the center of the left field? Yeah, maybe. Um, so 1920 divided by two, so we have a left and a right field, um, is uh, 960. And this divided by two is 480. And so we're gonna go with minus 480 here. And yeah, like we're used to, we're not just gonna duplicate this, but turn this into a prefab, of course. And now we can call this score text left. Duplicated, score text right. We already know this drill, right? And just move it to the other side. And I really don't like this uneven Y position. So let's make it a smack 400. And sometimes, yeah, this is just a, a little bug that sometimes pops up in this Unity version. You can just ignore it. Um, yeah, what we're gonna do now yeah, this is, this is like really wide, this text. It, it really pops into the eye and we don't want it to, to be this much in the center of attention. So now we're gonna choose our prefab and just change this vertex color to something more gray. Yeah, this looks good. It almost looks a bit like a face now. So I promised to show you uh, these different UI scaling modes and yeah, to focus on the UI. By the way, I also have a tutorial on focusing in Unity. Uh, check that one out. We can just double click on it. Um, and yeah, if we change this now, we can see this is right here and it's in, in the camera view. But if we change it to constant pixel size, it's gonna be outside of the camera view, which is not so good. And it's gonna change depending uh, which resolution we have. Like right now in full HD, it's visible, but in 4K, it's smaller. And we don't really want it to change like this. And this is why we use scale with screen size. Like in full HD, it looks the same as in 4K, which is great. So how do we tell these numbers to go up? They should go up when the ball reaches one of the score zones. And for that, we need these objects, the ball and the score text to communicate with each other in a way. And to enable this communication, we're first gonna create a score text script and we're gonna assign it to this prefab so that we can do something with the score text. And we're gonna go in here and we need a reference to our text. Uh, and to do this, we're gonna be uh, adding a using directive, TM Pro, so that we can access the text mesh pro components in script. And now what we're gonna do is public text mesh pro UGUI and we're just gonna call it text. So if we hop back into Unity, we can see that we now have to assign this reference. Let's do this real quick on the prefab, right? So that it works on both of these. Both of these have it assigned. Yeah, and next up, we're gonna do the communication. But not quite yet. I wanna show you something else about uh, prefabs. If we reset this reference on the prefab, these two won't have it. 
right? And if we now, by accident, like, or intentional, assign this one on just one of them, you see that this one turns into bold text. That means it has, this object in the scene has changes from the prefab. Now, if we want it to apply these changes to the prefab, so the prefab has it, and therefore the other one too, we can just right click here and click apply to prefab score text. We can also click up here and apply all. We're gonna do this right click, apply to prefab score text, and now the prefab has this change and the other instance too. So back to the communication, we're first gonna create a method on the score text that tells it to change the text. And yeah, we're gonna call it set score and give it a value, the value of the current score of either player. And we're gonna change the text accordingly. So we're gonna type text.text .text and yeah, give it the value. But as this value is an integer, which is a whole number, we can't just uh, type it in here. It has to be a string. So we're gonna call to string. It is getting a bit dark around here. So I'm gonna turn on a little bit of light. And yeah, since this is actually all we're gonna do with the score text, everything else we're gonna tell it from the outside. We're just gonna tick it off the list. So this next part is gonna be a bit complicated, but bear with me. We need some way for the ball to tell the score text to change. But the ball in and of itself is just a pawn. It's like if we compare this to a chess game, but we need a queen to take care of everything, of the game state. And this is where our game manager comes in. So let's create a new object and call it game manager. We're gonna move it up here and create a script for it of the same name. You see that Unity changes this, this little icon because it knows this is something special. And we're gonna assign the game manager to this object and open up the script. So this game manager, let's first remove this, uh, is gonna keep track of our scores. So we're gonna add uh, two integers for score player one and score player two. Now we need a method to increase these scores and they increase whenever a score zone has been reached. So we're gonna call this on score zone reached and we're gonna give it an ID. This ID is gonna be, oh, I forgot the void again, uh, never mind. And this ID is gonna identify which score zone was hit. So if the ID is one, we're gonna increase the score of player one. And if the ID is two, we're gonna increase the score of player two. Or are we? This is something we actually have to decide. So let's jump back to Unity. And first of all, we are gonna give our score zones that were just used to identify the trigger, if you remember, an ID. So now, if we hop on back, we can go into the level and we have the score zone. Score zone left and score zone right. So which ID are we gonna give each of these? So the score zone left increases the score of player two actually. And the score zone right, if it increases the score of player one. So we could now, yeah, we can handle this, this uh, diversion. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but um, we can handle this here or in code. I think we're just gonna handle it here. So we're gonna give the left score zone an ID of two and the right one an ID of one. So, that means whichever ID we hit, this player ID gets the score. And notice how this is overriding the prefab value again, but this time we don't want to apply this. We want these to be different. So now if we go back to our game manager and yeah, if this ID here is one, we're gonna increase the score of player one. And if it is two, we're gonna increase the score of player two. And we're gonna write this down like this. This plus plus just means plus one. Um, yeah, all right. So what else do we have to do? We have to update the score text, right? Uh, accordingly. 
So we need references to these. So we're gonna get score text and yeah, score text left and score text right. And in script, we are gonna just, we're gonna create a new method uh, for this to keep it separate. Update scores. And now we're just gonna say score text left dot. And we already have this method, right? We have set score. So we can say set score. And we're gonna say score player one. And the same thing goes for player two. So we're going to take the score text right and give it the score of player two. And now all we got to do is not all we're going to do, but what we're going to do next is uh, call update scores whenever a score zone was reached. And then it's gonna pass this on and update the score text. Uh, we still got to assign these. So in Unity, we're just gonna assign score text left and score text right. So now all that's left for us to do is to tell the game manager whenever a score zone got hit. And this is in the ball script. So we need a reference to the game manager. If you're already more advanced and know the concept of singletons, often these game managers are implemented as singletons and we might do this later down the line. But uh, for now, we are just gonna stick with just a direct reference to keep things more simple. So on trigger enter 2D, we got this score zone. And now we're just gonna, on the game manager, we're gonna say on score zone reached and we're gonna access the ID of the score zone. So back into Unity and we will assign this and let's try it out. So whenever the left score zone is hit, the right one goes up and whenever the right one is hit, the left one goes up. Okay, this is working as expected, nice. That means we can actually tick this off our list. Okay, just a few things left to do. So finally, we're gonna create some actual gameplay. Let's create a holder for our pedals. And let's create a new game object for a pedal. And what does this actually need? It, again, it needs a sprite renderer and I can't type anymore. So, uh, okay, and it's gonna be a square again, just as we're used to. And again, it's gonna need a box collider 2D, business as usual, and it's gonna also need a rigid body 2D because we are going to move it. And we're gonna move this one up because this is the most important one. So now this pedal, where is it gonna be positioned? Mm, we're just gonna drag this oh, <laughs> over here. Okay, minus, minus eight, seems good. It's a power of two and a round number, that's perfect. And now we're gonna make it a little thinner. Let's go with 0 0.33, yeah, that's uh, okay, it's, it's all right. And with Y of two, yeah, that looks like a good pedal. All right, let's give it a script and create a new C-sharp script pedal and assign it to this pedal. Next up, let's put the gravity to zero again on the pedal so it doesn't fall down. And like we're used to, let's make it a prefab. Call this one pedal left. You know this, right? We've done this a couple of times. And this one pedal right, and we're gonna position this on the other side again. So let's test this out. All right, so our ball is going at a random angle. Is it gonna hit, oh, <laughs> do you see that? It's actually bouncing the pedal away. So this is not the intended behavior. It's fun. It could be a gameplay mechanic, maybe, but it's not what we want of our Pong clone. So 
what do we have to do here? We got to go into the rigid body 2D and we got to set some constraints. So we don't want these pedals to change their rotation like they just did in a spectacular manner. And we also don't want them to change the X position. Um, so let's test this again. And now maybe we can have the ball like going between the pedals, like we don't set the initial angle. So it's always going. Oh yeah, we see the next problem. So yeah, this is, this is physics. Okay, so now this is bouncing it off, but we're gonna handle this when we handle player input, but the ball also shouldn't rotate. Like it can rotate if you want it to, but this might cause some very weird collisions because the collider also rotates and it's not gonna be a box collision anymore. Um, so we are also gonna freeze the rotation on the ball. And yeah, let's test it one last time, hopefully. <laughs> and set this to zero and this maybe also to zero. So it's always gonna spawn in the middle. And now it is working as we want it to. Great. So that's it for creating pedals actually. So we can already check this off the list. Nice. I do say nice a lot, but it is nice. <laughs> so yeah. So next up is player input. And there are at least two, two ways to do this in Unity. There's the old input manager. There's the new uh, Unity input system that you can access via the package manager. You can open it up, go to the Unity registry and you can find it here. But we're not going to use it. We're going to use the old input system because I Actually, to be honest, I haven't used this new input system a lot. I always use a plugin called Rewired for my projects. And the old input manager is, mm, I think, much more straightforward and easy to understand. So let's go with that one. So to access the input manager, go to Edit and Project Settings, which I got docked right here. And then you go to Input Manager. And you can see we already have a lot of predefined values here. Um, we're just gonna use the first two for, for what we want to achieve um, and we're gonna leave the rest as is. So the first one we're gonna call move player one and the second one move player two because that's all we need. So player one, I think, is on the left side so should probably be on the left side of the keyboard so we're gonna use WASD and you always got a negative and a positive button uh, positive in in our case means up and negative down so for the positive button we're gonna use W and for negative button S and delete these two and for player 2 this is already set up the way we want it to. We just have to delete these two. Down and up means the arrow keys. So we're going to use the arrow keys for player two. Let's jump into our pedal script. And yeah, like usual, we're going to delete these and add them later if we need them. And we're going to need them soon, but let's delete them for now. Um, and add a few variables. So we need a reference to our rigid body 2D to actually move the object. We need an ID to distinguish player one and player two. And we're also gonna use a move speed. So back into Unity and let's just assign this rigid body. Oh, we're gonna change back to the inspector. Let's just assign our rigid body now. And we can already change these IDs. Like this is player one on the left and this is player two on the right. Back inside the script, let's add the update method right again. And let's create two methods. And one of these is for processing input and the other one is to actually move the rigid bodies. So we're gonna call both of these from the update method. And let's check out process input first. How about we check out return values of functions while we're at it? So we can say we want to move by a certain value and we're going to give the move function this value. 
So maybe the process input function can give us this value. But how does it do it? If we change void to float, now it can return a float value. And you do this by writing return and then some value. And we can pass this value on to the move function. So let's get our inputs. Uh, we got to distinguish between player one and two, and this is how we're going to do it. We have a float defined called movement. This is also the one we are going to return. And then if you haven't seen this before, this is a switch statement. It is similar to an if else. It reads like if id equals one, case one, then do this. And if id equals two, then do this. Uh, if you got a lot of cases to cover, a switch statement is usually better than writing thousands of if-else statements. So, and what we are doing is we're getting the appropriate uh, movement input, like uh, input get axes. This is uh, calling the input manager, and yeah, we just get our predefined axes and get the value for each player. It's getting darker and darker around here, so let me just move the light a bit and I don't want to surprise you, so that's why I'm not doing a jump cut here. All right, this might be better. So let's actually move the players. Um, we got our rigid body to D and it's got a velocity and we want to set the Y of this velocity and we want to set it to this value times the move speed to the input value. And now this is uh, something a bit annoying. Uh, Unity tells us that we can't do it like this. Uh, I won't go into details why that is, but just let me tell you, you gotta get this velocity first into its own vector. Then you gotta set the Y on this own vector too. And then you gotta set the velocity again to this value. All right. And since I don't really like the word value anymore. It's so uh, unspecific. Let's call this movement and let's call it movement up here too. And now if we go back into Unity and you got to trust me on this, I will press the buttons. And if I move up or down, it is moving, but it is very slow. So we definitely got to adjust these values and it feels a bit floaty. So, but it's moving. So let's adjust the movement speed uh, for the pedal. Yeah, two is way too slow. So let's try eight. That's a number I kind of like. So let's try it out. And yeah, this feels much better. Um, but it's still kind of floaty, like it's not starting immediately. And it's also like, if I don't know if you can see this, if I let go, it stops slowly. I think we want immediate movement. And this is something we can do in the project settings with the gravity and sensitivity options. We're just gonna set both of these to 1000 for both players. Like this means um, how long the the movement input needs until it hits one. Like if I press a button, like for example, the arrow up and uh, this value, which one is it? Gravity? No, it's sensitivity. If sensitivity is low and I start pressing a button and it takes some time until it actually the movement value, this one right here, um, is gonna reach one. And the same thing goes for gravity, but just when letting go of the button. So if we let go of the button, uh, it reaches zero later if this value is low. So this can be good for your game. You got to try it out. But for our game right here, it's not so good. So we want direct movement. And yes, this feels much better. Great. So now I can play a round of Pong and this ball is so slow, but we're gonna get to that. So we got our player movement, player input and movement done. And you know what? It's getting a bit late and this tutorial is pretty long already. So I'm just gonna move this reset properly to the next part of this tutorial series. If you made it this far, congratulations to you. You just created Pong.
That's pretty damn cool, I think. But you know what? We're gonna make it even cooler in the next parts of this tutorial series. So stay tuned. If you have any feedback, questions or whatever comes to your mind, leave me a comment down below. And yeah, with that, I say goodbye. See you here again soon and have a great day.